Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is designer Linda Allard, and you can see her book and some of her clothes on the set, and I'm wearing one of her jackets today. And actor-producer Franco Colombo. I remember seeing him in Conan the Barbarian, and Stay Hungry, and Pumping Iron. You may remember seeing him as the bodybuilder who won the Mr. Olympia and the Mr. Universe titles. Franco is the true embodiment of the American dream. He went from sheep herder in Sardinia, where he was raised, to bodybuilder. He earned degrees in chiropractic and nutrition. He became an actor and is now a producer. Franco, how hard was this climb? I can't believe the build-up you gave me. <laughs> well, look at your build-up. <laughs> Thank you. How long did it take to get from sheep herder long to... Long time, 30 years. Is that 25 right? 25 to 30 years, yes. And it's, were you really a sheep herder? Oh, yes. When I was a kid, I used to be a shepherd in Sardinia. Oh, that's so romantic. I was like between <laughs> 9 and 11, you know, like a kid. I used to go in the summer, in winter to high school, and then go back to, to the sheep. When you, on the island? On the island, in Sardinia, yes. And now I just go back to make movies there. Ah, that's a lot different, I yeah. bet. Did you, have, did you sleep with the sheep? Is that what a sh shepherd does? You actually sleep in the mountains, yes, yes. You have the sheep in the mountains, they have a little hut, like a little house, and you sleep there with dogs, and, and you have to watch them. And then, were yeah. you interested in uh, bodybuilding then? All I could think was, I used to look at the mountains and say, I got to get out of here. I can't, oh. see <laughs> I can't be here like all my life. Is that right? Yes. You, I had that desire to leave? I had leave? that desire and I started actually, the first time I saw TV in my life, I was 15. And I saw um, a boxer, boxing. It was an American uh, championship in Madison Square Garden. Actually, it was merely grift boxing. And I said, that's what I want to do. I want to become a boxer. Really? And go to America, maybe that way. Really? So then did you start training? Then I started training. I started boxing. Then from, body, from boxing, I went to Germany. And in Germany, I switched to bodybuilding. Oh, how did that yeah. happen? Why bodybuilding from boxing? Because in boxing, every time I boxed, even when I won, I got it in the face, you know, and I <laughs> said, someday I'm going to really get it. <laughs> I said, I better change. So, so it was dangerous at <laughs> that time. Incredible. Did you yeah. meet Schwarzenegger then? I met Arnold in Munich in the gym. Yeah. You did? Actually, we met exactly in the first competition that he did and I did. Is that right? Yes, first time. But he was actually from, well, he was from Austria. Uh, Arnold is from Austria. I'm from Italy and we met in Munich. And w was there a certain gym that brought you together? Or yeah, was we should train together in the same gymnasium. Was it a special place? It was the best gym in Munich. Oh, that's why. Yeah. And then um, in 1968, Arnold came to the United States. In 1969, I came to the United States. You came, so you came a little bit after him. But yeah. did you keep your yeah. friendship up at that time? Oh, yeah, time? we still live together here in Los Angeles, too. You're still Yeah, friends. we are best friends now. When you were doing the bodybuilding at that time, was it dangerous? Were there steroids and a lot of drugs around? Or? No, when we started, there was no steroids yet. Steroids came later. So you didn't no. have to deal no. with any no, of No, we the... didn't have to deal with any of that or any problems like that, including... Bodybuilding at that time was beginning, then we got in, you know, when Pumping Iron came out. Mm -hmm. Is that when, when it came out? Yeah. And um, bodybuilding was very exciting then, and still is. We only talked about who's going to win, how we're going to beat the other person, you know. Very it, exciting. It, it was very close. It was a very close-knit yes, family, close I would yes, think. Yes, yes. And now, how has it changed? No, it's got more into the general public. Since Pumping Iron and the magazine, like Muscle and Fitness, is very big, is uh, over a million circulation, and got more into the general public. And also, bodybuilding is used to, get Im to improve mm -hmm. in the other sports. Ah, and so that's oh, great. So they use it as a training oh, device? Yes, as a training device to get the muscle stronger to perform better in another sport. Do you still 
Are you still involved in bodybuilding? Oh, yes. I train three or four times a week, five times sometimes. And I actually, my office, I give training programs to people and they can take my training program and they go and do it. Do they have it on tape? You have it on video? I have a training program on video, but also I just write it out for them. Oh, you do? Yeah. Good. That's what we need <laughs> yeah. to do. Somebody was saying that one of the best ways to maintain your weight is bodybuilding, which surprised me. A bodybuilding is the only sport, actually, that you can gain or lose weight or change the body part where you want to lose weight and where you want to gain weight at the same time. For example, what I'm saying is if you do bicycling or jogging or running, the legs get stronger and muscular, and the upper body gets skinnier. Ah, yeah. But in weight training, you can reverse it the way you want. The body part that you train with heavy weights gets bigger, and the body part that you train with very light weights can get smaller. So if you're bicycling, you can go in and train and keep your... I recommend if somebody does a lot of bicycling, running, leg sports, they should go and do upper body training with weights and balance it. Mm -hmm. That's very important. That's really good. Yeah. One of the new trends, they, they call it circuit training. Yes. What is that? Circuit training is like every, every year somebody comes with something new oh. <laughs> to keep so people excited. <laughs> and circuit training is you go from one machine to another in a circle and you train the entire body at once. Uh -huh. And then you come back and recycle and it do that it again. way. What, yeah. What's going to be new next year or the Who next knows? year? Maybe <laughs> training upside down. <laughs> 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 you also uh, became a doctor. Yes, I'm had a doctor you, of chiropractic, yeah. Had you gone to yeah. college in Europe? No, here in Los Angeles, when I was training and doing bodybuilding, Arnold went to business um, administration and I went to chiropractic college. We both used to go to school because we were training and we had time and we do that. I think that's so wonderful that you had that desire to keep improving yourself in other ways. Yeah, when you're born and poor and you have nothing, you better work hard and the ambition is what makes you do it. Everybody can do it. Exactly. It's the ambition. Exactly. And chiropractic and nutrition, I connected very, very much to bodybuilding. And because of that, I was so interested. So could it help you yeah. with your research? And oh, did it help you so remember? Much. When I trained, when I won Mr. Olympia in 1976, I wasn't a chiropractor yet. I used to train four hours a day. After I learned all the tricks from chiropractic and nutrition, in 1981, when I won the Olympia again, I only trained two hours a day. Is that right? Almost half. How old were you then in a in when you were Mr. Universe? Oh, when I won Mr. Olympia in 1981, I was already 40 years old. I'm 51 now. 52. Is that right? Yes. So you, oh. Yeah. So that kept you healthy, the yes, nutritional of course, thing? Yeah, what yeah. kind of nutritional um, uh, reminders did you give yourself all the time? But the most important is you have to get you have to keep it very simple. You can't go on crazy diets. You can't overeat or eat things you are allergic. One of the most important that people make a mistake today is eating allergy foods. If you're allergic to food, that food, turn, the body turns it into fat, stores it and turns it into fat and makes you hungry. So not necessarily people who gain weight are from eating too much. It's the allergy? It's all misinformed. Mostly it's the allergy food. Really? Yes. What's an allergy food? Anything? Allergy food is, uh, everybody's allergic to different things, I but see. you have to know, and it's easy to know, if you eat, let's say, lunch, and you're allergic to whatever you ate, you have four or five signs that you can notice to yourself. You don't have to go to the doctor for this. One of them is you feel sleepy after you eat. Uh -huh. The other one, you feel nauseated, you can't breathe. Sinus congestion. <laughs> yeah. Can't take a deep breath. Um, these are all signs of allergy. And you should think, what did I eat? And always trying to eat where you feel good after. Ah, sounds great. And um, also, not to mix too many foods at the same time. Like, it's very simple. The best food for protein is always fish, eggs, and meat comes third, and, veg and, and uh, soya beans comes fourth, uh, in order. The, most car the best carbohydrate protein food, mixed carbohydrate and protein, will be pasta is the best, then comes rice, then comes potatoes. Delicious. And soya bean. Couldn't be better. You know? And I think you were, you, you've were you been using all that in your own diet, haven't you? Got you got yes, yes. And you're acting. You're acting, you're producing. But now I'm going into making films. I, I made a film last year. 
the, which is coming out soon. We want to we want to see yeah, a one. clip from this. It's Beretta's Island. Beretta's Island. And you yes. made it in Italy. I made it in Sardinia and in Los Angeles and in Las Vegas. We're going to see a clip from it. Are you in it? Yeah, I hope so. I'm okay. starting. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see Beretta's Island. <laughs> So who was that familiar face in there? Who else could it be? It's Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> Arnold. Yeah. <laughs> so what, did he do the film here for you, or did you take it no, to Sardinia? No, we did it here in Los Angeles, yes. Now, when you yeah. go to Sardinia, I imagine you s stay under budget very easily. Very much under budget. That's why I go there, yes. Tell us yes. why it's so easy for you. The easiest thing is I can get everything, the location I can get very easy, like in the new movie we are producing right now, I'm making a second one, it's called Taken Alive, which will be out next year. Um, I had access to, to close down the airport. Uh -huh. The best <laughs> hotel in Costa Esmeralda in Sardinia, a state beach that no cars can go. Um, I got the best monument there, and all free of charge. I just get the permit and film. Because they love Mr. Colombo. I hope so. I think so. I, I hope think so. you brought a lot of a lot of good publicity to the island. It helps. And we don't want you to leave until you give us like a favorite pasta recipe. A oh. pasta recipe. I give you the most simple recipe. The best way to to pasta and feel really healthy. I'm thinking taste and health okay. is number one. You put olive oil in the pan. You put garlic. One one drop of uh, one little piece of garlic. And let it cook a little bit, then take it out. Don't leave it there. Okay. Then you can chop little onions. Then you peel uh, real tomatoes, or you buy uh, peeled tomatoes in the can, not tomato paste. Whole tomatoes. They have to be peeled. the all peeled tomatoes. Uh -huh. And then you smash that together. Yeah. And you cook them for 15 to 45 minutes, very short. Keep them fresh. And then you make the linguine, the long, the long pasta. You add salt and, and hot, little hot uh, pepper. Oh. And yeah. that's it. That's it? To keep it very simple. It very yes. good. We'll have that tonight. And al dente. It must be cooked only as to be durum with pasta for protein uh -huh. and health. And has to be al dente, which you only cook it for five to six minutes. Okay. I'm going to remember that. And it was so nice of you to come oh, and visit you. us today. Thank you. Thanks to Franco Colombo. And don't go away because Linda Allard will be back. We'll see you in a minute. Hi, we're back and we're with designer, author, illustrator, Linda Allard. And as I said before, Linda's clothes are on the set. I'm wearing one of her lovely jackets. Uh, Linda is the design director for the Ellen Tracy Company. She majored in fine arts at Kent State University and landed her first job out of school at Ellen Tracy. She's received the Dallas Fashion Award, which is very prestigious, in 1986 and 1987 
and she's active in her profession as a mentor and as a critic at uh, Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. Linda's in Beverly Hills at the Saks Fifth Avenue store on Wilshire Boulevard where she's showing her clothes and her new cookbook, Absolutely Delicious. Now, Linda, did you want to be a designer or a, or a chef? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to be a designer from the age of 10, but I've always loved to cook and eat. <laughs> <laughs> so you wanted to do both? I actually, yes. And then how did you um, get a job as a fine arts major in, in a fashion house? I was lucky. I was very naive. I came to New York not knowing a soul on a Greyhound bus with $200 and went door to door and floor to floor asking if anyone needed an assistant designer. And I stopped at Ellen Tracy and they hired me on the spot and I've been there ever since. And you wanted to, you thought you would do designing rather than doing anything in art. No, I knew that I really wanted to be a designer. Mm -hmm. I wanted to design clothes for women, but I couldn't afford to go to a fashion school in New York or someplace else. So oh. I won a scholarship in Ohio and went to uh, Kent State University. Oh, is that what happened? Well, was Ellen Tracy there when you went to work? Well, there is no Ellen Tracy. <laughs> is that really true? Really true. It's, it's very confusing to a lot of people, but it was one of those made-up names. It was very popular. Um, Ellen Tracy is, is uh, 45 years old this year, so it's a very um, old company. She's had a long, yes, good Ellen's life. Yes, Ellen's had a good, had a very <laughs> good had life. She's had a very nice, good life. Um, then she had her own name for a long time, but you were still working there. Mm -hmm. Well. Um, I started out as an assistant, and a couple years later, uh, Mr. Gowan, who owns the company, gave me the uh, job of designer. Of course, Ellen Tracy was quite different at that time. How did it change? Because I think people remember that Ellen Tracy name, and it may have taken 20 years with you there to get it into, like, the main, well, like, kind of a hip look. A hip well, I think what happened was, when I started Ellen Tracy, we were making blouses for the junior department, and oh. I was a young woman, and I was a junior customer at that time. I grew up along with a lot of other baby boomers and became a responsible uh, career woman. And I think that Ellen, the changes at Ellen Tracy reflect a lot of the women's movement today. So actually, when, when the line changes, it changes because of the way you're changing. A lot of it has to do with me. I think I reflect that customer. Because I was wondering how you know uh, what you should be designing for your clientele, what your clientele wants, and what is your clientele? Well, I think basically, as we've grown, we've become known for um, career clothes for mm. serious businesswomen. And I think that professional woman has a hard time dressing herself. She wants to look fabulous and feel fabulous, but look like she's a professional woman. And, and have you loosened that look up? I mean... Well, I think styles are getting looser. I mean, certainly what, uh, what is appropriate for women today in profession is certainly different than what when we started making those clothes 10 years ago. When we started thinking it had to be a jacket mm -hmm. with a tie exactly. and a white Exactly, a little shirt. blue suit or a gray suit. Yeah, it was pretty We've stiff. We've come a long way. I know, because do you think someone could wear something like this on the job? Oh, absolutely. Uh, but I you think, do? Yeah, I do. If you're in, if wow. you're, if you're in a relaxed Career. I mean, I think there's different kinds of careers. If you're sure. in the financial industry, that probably wouldn't be appropriate. Mm -hmm. That would be more for your casual, mm -hmm. um, after hours kind of thing. Tell us a little bit about it because I think the fabric is divine. It's a brushed silk. It's a suede silk, has oh. a fabulous, fabulous texture. It wears well, it travels well, and the colors are wonderful, aren't they? The watermelon and the uh, red pepper color. And, and is it a wide leg pant? It's a softer wide leg pant, very easy and then layered with the sweaters in avocado and apricot. Do you change, um, obviously you have to change every year in your design uh, work, but does your public have to buy new things every year? Well, we believe in wardrobing. And I think that's important also to the career woman. That's, she has to invest in clothes. She needs to look terrific. And she wants to look new. But she doesn't necessarily want to throw out her entire wardrobe that she purchased last year. That's ridiculous. Right. I mean, I, I believe in investment clothes. We make clothes that last for years. One of the biggest compliments I get when I go out and do these events, like I'm going to be doing at Saks, is customers come up and say, you know, I'm wearing something that I bought from Ellen Tracy five years ago. Is that OK? And I said, that's wonderful. I love to hear that. But then they can always find something in the new collection that so, color coordinates or will work with something you bought last year or the year before. So maybe a sweater, 
maybe these wide leg pants that are fabulous with an, a jacket. With a different that you kind have. of a jacket. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then behind on this side, and the same jacket that I have, which is like. It, it feels like linen. It is. It's a washed <laughs> linen. It's, it's So it's very soft and it's already been softened for you and it won't wrinkle because it already has that softer semi-wrinkled hand. So it has a, and that's from the company collection, which is definitely more casual collection. But, but it seems to me this could work with a skirt or oh, something, dark blue pants mm -hmm. or something like that and, and a different kind of a shirt to wear to, to work. Absolutely. I mean, we're showing it there very casual with a company t-shirt, but you could certainly wear that with a pair of uh, uh, navy linen pants or blue linen pants and or skirt and wear it with a blouse to the office. What about uh, fabrics? Do you have special favorite kinds of fabrics? Well, I love all kinds of fabrics. I love the way they feel and the way they look and the textures of them and the colors. I think that that, that tactile feeling is, is one of the most important things that you can do, one of the most exciting things that you can do because jacket styles don't change a lot. The proportion changes a little bit or the fit changes, but you can do wonderful things with the texture and the color. And do you design the fabrics? We design all the fabrics ourselves. You do? Oh, so they're all? Uh -huh. they're, they're all custom made. We have an oh. um, art department that um, works out all the colors and patterns and prints. Um, and the entire collection starts with color. The color palette is where we begin each collection. And that's where your art comes in. That has yes. to be your background. Yes, and I, I think in a way, as much as I wanted to go to fashion design school when I was young, I think my art history and my um, art background has served me very well over the years. Because it seems like it's such an influence, even the transition from uh, designing the fabrics to making the clothes and making co combinations of colors. I mean, I don't know if anyone would be uh, strong enough to go out and put these colors together if you didn't do it. Well, I think that... I think you can be very adventurous as a consumer, but a lot of times consumers want to be told you can do this and, and show it that way. And they, and they say, well, I would have never thought of that, but I love the way it looks. And you know, the, the great thing is we have this book, absolutely delicious, right in front of it. And the red is from the red peppers. The, the golden color looks like the cheese and the pasta. And the green looks like the bottle of <laughs> olive oil or some lettuce that you would have. It looks like it came right off the table. Well, they were vegetable dye colors, so uh, food is a very important part of my life. I love um, food and food colors, and it's um, so yummy. So tell us how this book, Absolutely Delicious, got started. Well, actually, my niece, when she got married, asked me if I would share some of my recipes um, with her, and I started handwriting them, and I thought, this would be a rather nice Christmas present. We do a lot of, our family does a lot of very creative handmade hand done Christmas gifts every year and I thought this would be a wonderful Christmas gift and as I got going this little pamphlet turned into a 300 page book with uh, watercolor illustrations. Well where did you test the recipes or were they all your they're, own? They're recipes that I've collected over the years some of the recipes my mother taught me when I was very young and my grandmother my aunts and family recipes a lot of them are things that I have picked up as I've traveled and gone home and experimented experimented with and, and tested. And so you didn't have to do a test kitchen for each one of these things? No, no. Most of them I knew by heart and would just, <laughs> it was a question of writing them down. The confusing part came after I had done the family book and then a friend of mine took the book to Random House and they wanted to publish it. Then I had to sit down and say, instead of take a casserole dish, I had to measure and say, take a two-quart casserole dish. So uh -huh. I did have to go back and do some adjustments so it was a little bit clearer. That's what the, I was even the illustrations, I mean, I haven't seen a cookbook that has excited me as much as this. I think well, more, more just to read it or to look at it, to see your hand in it. This printing, is it really your printing? Well, yes, I wrote it all myself. <laughs> and that, was, that was much harder than I thought because um, making one whole page without an error on it was quite a challenge. But. I think it's great. It, here we have this open to minestrone. Minestrone means big soup. Exactly. It is a hearty vegetable soup that varies from region to region in Italy. I mean, it's so simple. It is a simple <laughs> cookbook. I guess because I started out, I love simple cooking. I think there's nothing better in the whole world than very relaxed country food. And mostly those are very simple recipes. And because I thought of it in terms of beginning cooks like my niece, I purposely kept oh. them very simple. And the thing that I found when I've been out talking to people about the book, a lot of people who say, say to me, well, 
I don't cook, but I could cook the recipes in this cookbook. <laughs> well, because it's inviting. Mm -hmm. If you see this, uh, uh, the, um, the picture here with a potato and an onion and what a carrot and celery and Some parsley. Some tomatoes, a few beans. Tomato and a few <laughs> beans. Tell us this recipe, minestrone. Well, well, basically, you start with um, chopped onions, celery, and carrots and put it in a little olive oil with a clove of garlic and saute it for a few minutes till it softens and gets a little bit golden. And then you add um, the tomatoes and a little salt and pepper and cook it until it gets soft. <laughs> add the potatoes, add the beans, and a little macaroni in the end, and uh, it's And there finished. it is? That's it. Do you have to be Italian to eat this? No. <laughs> <laughs> or to cook it? No. What, no. Was, what was your background? Where were you born? I was born in Ohio. Oh, so you're a Midwest? I'm a Midwest gal. And what, what did your mother specialize in cooking? I think good, straightforward food. A lot of um, my mother's recipes are in there, just biscuits, baked ham, potato salad. I mean, a lot of those special occasion foods. There's a whole Christmas section on our traditional Christmas dinner. It's in, it's in here? in the book. Mm -hmm. And Christmas cookies. And, and also desserts. I saw a strawberry shortcake mm -hmm. in there. A very <laughs> Ohio strawberry shortcake. <laughs> Do you live in the city in New York? Uh, during the week I live in the city and on the weekends I go to my country house where I garden and cook. So that's, that's where this all comes mm -hmm. in. Do we see uh, a magazine coming from Ellen Tracy? Well, we publish an e-book twice a year. What is that? Well, that is a, um, a comprehensive look at the collection for the season and it's been very successful. It's very helpful. Um, in the stores helping uh, customers decide what they want, but we also mail it to our select Ellen Tracy customers. And a lot of customers will just call in and say, I like the outfit on page 72, can you send it to me? So it is, even though they, they have to buy it through a store, they can't buy it directly through Ellen Tracy, but it's helpful. It's like help a catalog, exactly. but I mean like a full-blown mm -hmm. magazine. It's that beautifully we, <laughs> done. That Beautiful. we can buy on the stands. We can have your recipes, we can have your clothes, we can have Ellen <laughs> okay. Tracy Speaks. Everywhere. <laughs> Out of Linda Allard's mouth. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much thank for you. being with us. Enjoyed. And thank you to all of our viewers who are writing to us all the time. You're sending your letters to 520 South Grand, the eighth floor in Los Angeles. And tell us what you think of Ellen's work today and her recipes. See you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.